Hey everybody, welcome to the GoEasyCats.com football preview show. We are back with another episode. This is senior editor Matt Marino, joined by, as always, staff writer Troy Hutchison. Now it gets fun, Troy. Uh, <laughs> Arizona heading into, I wouldn't quite say a brutal stretch. I think last year was brutal because you had a team in Arizona that wasn't playing well and really struggling to do anything positive. Feels different this year, but a very challenging portion of the schedule, the challenging portion of the schedule you have ranked teams ahead of you. We'll see if they all end up ranked by the end of this, you know, little run here that's coming up over the next several weeks for Arizona. But the first one's ranked. Uh, you got Oregon oh, this yeah. week, number 12 uh, in the AP poll. Uh, has really rebounded nicely after losing to Georgia to open the season. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk about last week's game a little bit. Um, we'll jump right into that game against Colorado. You don't want to say it's a must win, but it was a must win because you just couldn't lose. It wasn't mm-hmm. must win because you need to, you know, you're trying to win the game. It's because you just, you can't lose that game. Um, eventually Arizona does win that game pretty easily. Uh, the offense really exploded. Uh, defense was not amazing, but better. Um, mm-hmm. Still gave up the most amount of points that Colorado has scored this season, but um, the coach killers, Arizona, Carl Durrell dismissed as head coach after that game uh, last week against Arizona. Colorado's uh, AD and their leaders there said enough is enough. You can't lose to Arizona. Can't have this, uh, you know, winless start. And that was it. And Carl Durrell is out. They've made some coaching uh, adjustments. Um, Defensive coordinators out. Um, But that's for the past. That's for Colorado people to worry about. We're talking Mm -hmm. about Arizona. Um, But what what did you see out there that, um, you know, worked well for Arizona? Obviously, the offense was a big deal. But what were some of your big takeaways from last week's win? Yeah, I think number one was pass protection. Um, I think Jaden Delora only got sacked once in the game, if at all. Uh, he pretty much had a clean pocket to work with. He had the ability to roll right, roll left, and find guys without being under duress. Uh, it wasn't like the Mississippi State game where he was rolling, and there's a big 300-pound defensive lineman bearing down on him. Um, just tremendous job by the offensive line, and then they got things going in the run game as well. And then – Let's talk about Jaden Delora. You know, he's been very good this season. I think Arizona fans still expected more out of him. He had his signature moment uh, first time this year for Arizona. Six touchdown passes, uh, completion percentage of like 72%. And just, man, it looked easy out there for him. He was finding Jacob Cowing, Dorian Sener early in the game. T-Mac, hell, he caught a pass from T-Mac. Arizona offensively was able to do whatever it wanted to. Um, just a terrific offensive performance. And then finally, defensively, you know, I think everybody is saying it was a better defensive performance. But for me, even though they only allowed 154 yards rushing, Colorado was playing from behind. And there are still a lot of missed tackles. I remember one play on the left side of the field. Um, Colorado's running back. I don't remember who got the ball in that situation, but they broke five tackles and got within the Arizona 2015 yard line. Uh, You just can't have that. Um, It was a better performance, but still um, too many missed tackles. And when you're going up against a team like you have coming this week, you you can't have that. Yeah. Um, Back to Jane Delore a little bit. I know there were some groans from some Arizona fans and and, um, because of the weekly awards in the Uh, Mm -hmm. Pac-12. T-Mac wins his first uh, Pac-12 freshman of the week. I thought it was very much deserved. He had two of the better catches you're going to see this entire season. One very much so could be tough to to top. Although Jacob Cowan, I think, did top it in that game. Um, But, or Doran Singer, rather, Mm -hmm. uh, topped it in that game. Um, But Jane Delora didn't win Offensive Player of the Week. That went to uh, DTR from UCLA. They obviously beat the, the, what was at that point, the number 15 team in the country. Washington uh, was undefeated, gave them their first loss. Do you have a gripe with Jane Delora not winning the Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Week award? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of do. I think Jaden did deserve the award, had a terrific performance. I know he's going up against a Colorado team that, let's face it, might be one of the worst in the country. But uh, it was a big moment for him, a big moment for Arizona as a team because it was, like you said, a must-win game. He came out there, put his uh, foot on Colorado's throat and never let off in. He had a terrific game. Uh, you know, DTR won it, had a great performance. I get he played a ranked Washington Husky team. But if you remember, Washington almost came back in that game 
Uh, they ended up losing 40 to 32. So we're talking about a domination performance compared to a very damn good performance, but almost letting the game slip away from you at the same time. It would have been nice, I think, to see like a co kind of offensive player of the week. I think there is a way just with the voting for, for people who don't know, it's voted on by the media members and there's a point system and all that stuff. And um, depending on who gets the most points, that's who wins the award. Uh, obviously, we're not privy to uh, the final total um, of the points. So it could have been, you know, one point separating the two, but um, it would have been interesting, or at least I think deserve to have kind of a co offensive player of the week award, because I, I don't think you can look beyond who they're playing. You know, Colorado's the worst team in the conference. They're terrible. Um, you should be beating them by a lot of points. You should be having success. On the other side, UCLA beat a team that was undefeated that, you know, had beat Michigan State already and was ranked and had things rolling offensively. And so um, it was a difficult week to pick it. I think if I'm going to guess what happened with voters was that they kind of looked at what I just said and said one guy was playing against Colorado, which is a terrible team, and one guy was playing against an undefeated team and beat them. Um, so I think that's probably what made the difference. But uh, Jane Delora, regardless of winning the award or not, had a really strong week, really looks more comfortable than he did even in the first couple of weeks. Um, there's there's fewer and fewer moments of hesitation with him. Um, early on, there was moments where you go, oh, and you, can, you could see he was telegraphing the interceptions, which have kind of disappeared. Um, I guess I got to knock on wood and don't jinx it there. But they've kind of those issues have kind of gone away where he's now making the plays that you said, OK, there's the open man hit him. And he's making those plays as opposed to waiting it out, seeing what develops, and then, you know, forcing the throw down the field and throwing an interception. So I think you've seen growth with him. I think you've seen him settle in, which is all good for the offense. You're seeing the tight end get used a lot. You're seeing these receivers really come alive. Um, all three of the starters really have started to hit their stride. I mean, this last week, I think, was a great week for all of them. Uh, they all kind of each had their moment. As I mentioned, Doran Singer had that great catch down the sideline. Um, T-Mac had a couple of really, just really impressive catches that were kind of vintage T-Mac, um, you know, and Jacob County is just continuing to do his thing and, you know, be one of the top receivers in the country. So um, really a lot uh, of positive momentum for the offense. The defense was better. I yeah. think, I think everyone can agree they were better, but there's still a lot of holes in that defense and it wasn't great. Um, it wasn't the great stride you'd hope to see against, you know, a team like Colorado. You want to see them come out and completely dominate them. I mean, I think, what would have made kind of put all the fans at ease, I think, would have been a shutout. I think if you shut out Colorado, you beat them, you know, by a bunch of touchdowns and you do what you're supposed to do to a team like that. I think people would be like, okay, whatever happened, you know, in that last game or against Cal was kind of just a hiccup. Um, you know, you'll get back to it and, and they're kind of on the right track again. This is not where you want to be going up against Oregon. What did you see defensively that, that is maybe has you a little bit concerned? Yeah, again, number one, missed tackles. Um, they talked about going back to fundamentals the whole entire week, and it seemed like guys were still out of position, um, just letting guys slip through their grasp. Uh, number two, started to build up in the passing game a little bit. Uh, McCown had some success, but um, overall, good job defensively in the passing game, but he did find some guys that were wide open, which usually you haven't seen that much against Arizona this season. I think their pass defense is one of the better def uh, defensive units in the Pac-12, uh, but they they got gashed a little bit, not too badly. But for me, it starts at the line of scrimmage. The defensive line has been great at getting to the quarterback, but that front seven, front six, whatever you want to call it, they're just getting pushed back when it comes to the running game. I don't know if they're not prepared for those plays at those times. I really don't know what it is. Because you see them get a push when it's step back and pass, when it's a pass play and getting in there. But for some reason against the run, they're just getting pushed three, four yards behind uh, past the line of scrimmage. And when you have that, you have open holes. Obviously, there's a lot of confidence and, and you know, happiness with that win against Colorado. I think it put them, you know, in a better mood, obviously, than the week before. And, um, you know, you're feeling confident and you want to get that win. Um, you're above 500. Um, but what was your pulse of just listening to everyone talk this week? Obviously, T Mac and Isaiah Taylor were the two players that spoke, so maybe they can't put things in as much perspective as maybe an older veteran player might at this point in, in the season. But, um, as I mentioned, it feels like there's kind of two seasons within this one, uh, where you kind of are through the first portion, which was like, hey, these are your chances to win some games because you have some challenging, challenging matchups coming up ahead. 
Where do you feel like the team is at overall right now, coming off that Colorado win, heading into this matchup against Oregon? I think they're feeling confident as a team. Like you said, the players are kind of hard to read as freshmen. They they laugh, they have fun in those interviews, and it's a little bit different situation when it is a veteran player. Um, but I think you got from the coaching staff a sense of, holy shit, this is like, this is the moment we've been preparing for these games coming up. Um, it's time to start wrapping, uh, getting gaining some ground on some situations like the running game, um, pass protection, turnovers, which they've done some of those things, but they really need to focus on that running game. And when Jed Fish was talking, I mean, he named all the great things Oregon can do. Um, talk about their players, talked about their depth. And as he continued to talk, he got a sense of, man, they're really just, how are we going to stop them? Um, I'm sure they'll have a game plan and the question's going to come down to, can the players execute it defensively? But I mean, the defense, as much as they don't want to say it's a huge problem, the run defense is a huge problem. And I think they are just trying to figure out how to piece it together. The run defense, I think, is a big problem. It becomes a huge problem when you play a team that runs the ball really well. And unfortunately for Arizona, one of the it top is. rushing teams in the country, not just the Pac-12, they are the number one team in the Pac-12 in terms of rushing, but they're one of the top 10 teams in the country in terms of rushing coming in this weekend, Oregon. They don't just do with their backs. Amazingly, they also do with their quarterback, who I think everyone was like when they got Bo Nix, the transfer from Auburn, I think a lot of people were like, okay, sure. that's the guy they're going to get. But yeah. Kenny Dillingham has pulled something out of him. Uh, he's looked very good. He's they've had he's had some moments. He's definitely had some moments where you go, okay, I, I know who that guy is. I've seen that guy before. Um, but he's kind of pulled something out of him, brought some more consistency to his game. Um, and he's, you know, doing it with his feet and you know, doing well with his arm and kind of has that offense rolling. Uh, well, I mean, they're one of the top offenses in the country right now. And, um, you know, it is led by their running game, but uh, they do a lot of different things and they're going to present a lot of different problems. I think they're maybe not as top tier talented as teams they've had in the past that Arizona has played against and has at moments had some close games against beat one of them a few years ago. Um, but they have a lot of talent. They have a lot of playmakers. Um, they have guys that, you know, Arizona is going to have to pay attention to. When you look at this overall matchup, um, you know, what are a few things that you're keen in on already this week um, that you're going to be, you know, paying attention to once these two teams get on the field on Saturday? Yeah, number one, it's the battle of a poor run defense versus a poor pass defense. Um, who can piece together something, create a turnover, have a run stop here. Arizona has been one of the worst run defenses in the country this season. One of the worst in the pack 12 and on the same token, Oregon's been terrible against the pass. Um, St Stenson uh, Bennett was able to light them up for 353 yards. Not a bad quarterback, obviously on a national championship team, but that's a guy that shouldn't pass for 350 yards against you. Um, and there there's more and more of that going on at Oregon. I, and you know, it's funny because Oregon, when you look in the past, They've had really good DBs. So right now they're in flux there. I don't know if there's some injuries there um, in the secondary, but that's area to look at. Number two is penalties. Arizona has done a great job of cutting down on penalties from a year prior, where they're one of the most penalized teams in the country. Um, they're kind of middle of the pack right now, which is a good step. Uh, you look on the other side, Oregon is one of the most penalized teams. Uh, they've given up an average of 72 yards and penalty yards per game. Uh, a lot of Arizona fans remember back in 2014 when they saw the little, you know, the little prayer there that got uh, Arizona another penalty, and they were able to take that and get the field goal and win that game against Oregon on the road. Um, disciplined football, it's just not happening there in Oregon, even though they are winning. And then lastly, what will these two quarterbacks do against each other? Because both of them are playing at a high level, um, a little bit different. You know, Bo Nix has been able to run the football with consistency this year, and Jaden Delora is getting it done with the arm, but they're both mobile quarterbacks, and they seem to be clicking on all cylinders right now. So when you look at these two teams, they're kind of both winners of the transfer portal during the offseason. Both teams really attacked it, you know, pretty vigorously. Uh, Arizona, obviously, uh, everyone knows kind of who they went and got. You know, they've got a starting quarterback. Uh, they got a starting running back. They got a starting defensive end. Uh, all three of those guys have made their impact. They've got, you know, a, a starting wide receiver or inside receiver, rather, who, um, you know, Jacob Cowan, who was one of the best in the country and a school like Oregon wanted. Um, and Oregon, uh, we mentioned Bo Nix, uh, you know, 
They, they got a running back. They got a lot of different players. They got some receivers. Um, they got a lot of different players that were able to come in. They got some defensive linemen um, to really kind of fill out that roster and fill out some of the holes. Um, when you look at, you know, what both of these teams have accomplished in the transfer portal, how much do you look at that and go, this is kind of the future of college football and this is what it's going to be. And this is kind of what you have where you, when we're looking at both of these teams and you go down the list of key players, Arizona obviously has some freshmen, but you look at the key player, if I'm sure when we're going to talk about them here soon, but when you look at key players for both teams, a lot of them are transfers. Is that kind of just what uh, college football is going to be from now on? Yeah. Welcome to college athletics, 2022. I mean, it's in football, basketball, baseball, softball. You're seeing it all over in college sports. And right now it's kind of like free agents, uh, free agent frenzy in the NFL. You know, there's like that week or so in the off season where everybody's going everywhere. Um, kids aren't patient anymore. You know, they want playing time right away, or they just want to go for a better opportunity. Like you see Pedix at Washington, Bonix at Oregon, and, you know, you see better opportunities out there and you go for it. Um, it's just aren't willing to stay anymore and wait around for something to happen. They're going to go out and make it happen. And you've seen both of these schools really thrive in the transfer portal, um, not only this season, but success last season as well. Well, and you look at, sometimes it's not even the players wanting to get out. You look at a guy like James Delora. He had no option because Washington State hires his, you know, Cam Ward's offensive coordinator, mm -hmm. uh, brings him along as well. What is James Delora supposed to think? And obviously he got out and said, I'm going to go play at Arizona. And so I think it's worked out for both both teams very well. But um, it's it's all really interesting and all kind of uh, just becoming the norm. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, a lot of high school recruits, unfortunately, I know, obviously that's kind of what I do on my day to day and, uh, cover a lot of recruiting. I've talked to a lot of recruits and there's just a lot of schools are saying, why are we going to take a chance on somebody who might not be exactly what we want when we can go and look at the transfer portal and find a player, know exactly what he's capable of at the college level and know exactly what we're getting. Look at and, UCLA. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the example that comes to mind for sure. Yeah. Um, but it, it's all an interesting story, but it's, these are two teams, just as I, you know, I've thought about this game this week, they both have really utilized the transfer portal well and are really leaning on those players. But as we get into kind of the nitty gritty of this game, um, you know, I mentioned maybe on that note, who are some players that you're going to be keeping an eye on, um, this week and, and you feel like you're going to be key players in this game for both teams. Yeah. So let's start off with. Arizona, I think number one, uh, look at the defensive side of the football, they get Jackson Turner back. That was a huge loss this past week for Arizona, um, has been one of the kind of like ball hawks on defense, kind of similar to Bondurant back in the day, but longer, more athletic, I would say. He just seems to be around the football and he's one of the leaders in that secondary. They get him back and that's going to be huge, not only for the passing game, but he stopped some runs as well and got it in the backfield too. So that could help the uh, run defense as well. Number two, um, let's be honest, it's going to be J uh, Jacob Gowing in that receiving core. Uh, Oregon's defense, again, is one of the worst against the pass and they had a huge game against Colorado. Can you repeat this performance and kind of establish yourself as one of those groups in the country, not only in the conference, but in the whole entire country, because right now Arizona's receiving core is looked at as a very good group, which they are highly talented. Um, one of the top in the Pac-12. But if you have a great game against Oregon, you're going to be looked at differently across the country. On the Oregon side of the, of the ball, I mean, it's going to start in the ground game. So they have multiple backs that have been able to go over 200 yards this season, along with Bo Nix running as well. So can they continue that momentum and force Arizona to put – eight, nine guys in the box, slow down the running game and open up the passing game against that secondary. So that's number one. Number two is going to be uh, Penel Pen Sewell, if I got that name correctly. Um, very tremendous player, great linebacker. Um, Oregon's front seven is one of the best in college football. I think they rank 10th nationally in rushing yards per game at 94.6. Uh, that's, that's insane. You don't see a lot of run defenses like that anymore. And if they can force Arizona to be one dimensional, that's going to be a big problem for the Wildcats. Noah Sewell. Panay Sewell wow. is playing offensive line for the Detroit Lions. My bad. Of course. Bad. A lot of Sewell brothers, all very good. Uh, yes. But Noah Sewell is the linebacker at Oregon right now. He's very good. Um, they have a lot of talented players. Um, Brand Dorless, defensive lineman, has been very, very good this season. Um, mm -hmm. 
Bucky Irving has been another speaking of transfers. He came from Minnesota, kind of an unassuming guy at Minnesota. I mean, he did some things, but he wasn't like an all conference type of player. I mean, he was just, he's just a freshman and uh, just played one season there, but it wasn't exactly like somebody that you go, Oh wow. He's going to be a game changer, but he's really been a game changer for Oregon in that ground game. But you look at their numbers and it's not just one guy. And I think that's what's maybe even more impressive that they are able to run the ball so well. It does, you know, a lot of it does come from Knicks. He has five rushing touchdowns, but uh, they kind of spread that ball around on the ground game and they kind of do what I think everyone anticipated Arizona was going to do, which is, you know, play five or six or seven guys at running back and get a bunch of touches to a bunch of guys where Arizona's kind of kept it pretty tight at the running back spot. A lot of Michael Wiley, obviously speedy Luke goes down. That kind of takes an element out of it, but um, you know, DJ Williams and, and uh, Jonah Coleman have kind of been the other guys that have really kind of, they've been focused on, but um yeah. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting matchup, and I think it's one of those things where it's whoever can do what they do well, the best, <laughs> that's who's going to win this game. I mean, it's going to be one of those things where if Arizona is able to pass the ball around, I think that's where if you are Arizona, you come into this with some confidence because you're going, hey, we just had our best game passing the ball. That's one thing they don't do well. There's going to be no secrets about what you're trying to do. And I think the one thing that works for Arizona in this game, and um, we'll get to predictions later, but I know... Arizona fans, and, and I think you're in the same boat too, have this feeling of like, maybe this could be one of those games where it's not that daunting of a task. It's, I mean, it, yes, Oregon is ranked. Yes, they've looked very good since uh, the Georgia game, but it doesn't feel like the same Oregon team that of old. I think they're going to get there. I, I pay attention to recruiting, cover their recruiting. Um, they have some very, very, very talented players coming in, and they're going to get back to that point where you're going, wow, this is a roster full of just future NFL players. They're just not there yet. Um, yeah. They're kind of, they kind of just came in and plugged some holes, but um, I think if you're Arizona, you go, cause if you're a team that, and you do something well, really well, like, you know, stop the run um, or run the ball well or whatever uh, you're looking at a team and you go, what can we do to make them one dimensional? If you're Arizona's offense right now, it's difficult to make them one dimensional. Um, no one's really done it. Yes. Teams have had maybe some success in slowing down the running game, but uh, in those games, Arizona has really passed it well. And so, uh, I think it's really difficult to make them one dimensional. I think if they're, if it was easier to do so, I think this could be more of a lopsided game and you go, Arizona probably has no chance. But um, mm -hmm. I think the fact that Arizona is difficult to make one dimensional, I think plays into their chances in this game and having a better opportunity to pull out an upset win. Um, I think Oregon, it'll be interesting. I think if Arizona's defense was just a little bit better and maybe had a little bit more of a true identity, I think this is still a team that's really a defense rather that's really looking for its identity still. It doesn't really necessarily know what it wants to be. It's not that team that's going to stop the run, um, but it's not necessarily that team that's like, hey, you're not going to pass on us either. They're kind of more of that last year where it was like, you couldn't pass on Arizona because they played that man defense. That was the goal. The goal was, we're not going to go for turnovers. We're not going to you know, try and change the game with uh, you know, getting interceptions and fumbles. We're going to just lock up and make sure that you're not getting any yards. And that was their goal. And they did that. They're very successful at it. Different look this year. So they're not that same team in terms of playing lockup kind of defense on the edges and completely stopping a passing game. But um, I think Arizona is probably more capable of making Oregon one dimensional. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately for Arizona, if you take away that passing game, that running game is so good that it could be a difficult game. But um, as you look at maybe some things that you're going to at least be watching closely um, in this game, what are a few things on your mind that you say, you know, Arizona has to do this if it wants to win this game? Yeah, you know, we talk about the passing game for Arizona, which I think will be a key to win this game if Arizona wants to walk away with a W. But let's talk about the running game a little bit. They can't have a Mississippi State performance because you alluded to the one dimensional and that's the only game where they were truly one dimensional. Mississippi State held them to 40 yards on 22 carries. Um, if you're doing that, you're not going to be anywhere in this game. I think the one thing I'm looking for is to see if Arizona comes out and tries to run the ball on this defense, because I think that'd be a different mindset. Um, like I said, this defense is good against the run, but if you try to run ball early, establish a little bit of a run, it might open up the field way more than, you know, just throwing the ball the whole entire game. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is can Arizona get to the quarterback? Uh, Bo Nix has only been sacked once. I know that's a lot to deal with him being able to run, but Oregon's offense line is filled with four or five star guys that are really talented and they haven't given up a lot of sacks this year, just one sack. 
not a lot of quarterback pressures as well. Can Arizona, who has improved in getting to the quarterback, get to Bo Nix and make him uncomfortable? Um, he's been able to sit in that pocket and do what he wants. If you're able to make him uncomfortable, that's going to be key for Arizona. And then number two, can Oregon play defensive, uh, not defensive football, but disciplined football? Uh, they haven't shown that ability all season long. And when you're in a road game in a possible sellout, which Arizona is apparently 800 tickets away from that. Um, we'll see if all those fans show up on time. Uh, but if it is a sellout and it's a raucous crowd and you're having all these penalties, it's going to start to stack up. And then you're going to have confusion on the line. You're going to have confusion on defense and it's going to build up. So can you play de de uh, disciplined football in this game? The unfortunate part, I think, of that sellout is that, for Arizona at least, is that I think it will be a very pretty prominent contingent of Oregon fans based on the sounds of it engaging some of uh, the Oregon message boards and getting a feel for that side of things this week. It sounds like there's a pretty big contingent of Oregon fans making the trip down to Arizona. So we'll see how, I mean, which could lead to being raucous. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not going to be raucous because they can definitely bring the energy themselves. But um, I think for Arizona fans, it'd be nice. I think for Arizona's team, it would be nice to have, you know, uh, predominantly Ares, pro Arizona crowd and see that stadium full because that's, you know, it's a big game, but um hasn't happened for a while. It hasn't happened for a really long time. And so, yeah, it'd be really nice for, to see that. I think for Ares, for those players, I mean, especially someone like Jalen Harris and some of these guys that have been around where you go, okay, this is, this is real college football now. Um, mm -hmm. But lastly, before we get into predictions, uh, do you have one X factor that you're looking at that you're saying this could be a guy that kind of tips the favor and scale of one team or the other? Yeah, X factor for Arizona. Uh, let's go with Hunter Eccles. Um, he's been able to get in that backfield, leads the team in tackles for loss, been great against the run as well. Um, he's kind of like that leader on the defensive line. You know, I think Arizona has two, three leaders on defense, and he's one of those guys. So he's my X factor for Arizona and just seeing if he can get in that backfield and create some havoc. And then number two X factor for Oregon on this side, is Bo Nix. Um, you know, I think everybody, you you kind of mentioned it early on. Um, when he went to Oregon, everybody's like, eh, whatever. I didn't look at him as a very good quarterback at Auburn. I thought he was just okay. Um, you know, played in a good system, had a lot of guys around him, and he was what he was. But he's been playing out of his mind. He's been playing at a very high level. Can he keep it up? Um, you know, it's it, like we said, it's going to be a big crowd, maybe a lot of Oregon fans there. What does he do under pressure in that type of environment? I know he's played in the SEC where they have those all the time, but this is his first time with Oregon. And how is he able to lead that team? I'm glad he didn't take mine because I want to bring this up. Uh, Tetsuro McMillan, I was committed to play at Oregon, committed to a different coaching staff, but Kenny Dillingham, Dan Lanning, they tried to get him to go to Oregon. They tried, I mean, they might tell a different story. T Mac might downplay that a little bit, but they wanted him. I mean, I think who wouldn't, you know, at that point, yeah. if you have, you have a five-star wide receiver, five-star anything, and he's already committed to your school and all you have to do is keep him. I mean, who wouldn't want, you know, put in, want to put in the effort and who wouldn't want T Mac on their team. And so um, they wanted him, uh, didn't work out that way. He ended up going to Arizona. I think there's going to be a lot of attention on him from Oregon this week. I also think you're looking at a freshman, a true freshman who's playing in what his sixth game or whatever it is. Um, just had his best game. He's not the type of player to kind of back down in these situations, but any type of freshman who gets in this situation might press a little bit and might be trying to do a little bit too much um, to, to show, hey, you could have had me, you didn't get me, now I'm over here. Um, he's not that mentality, but I, I that would be my fear going into this game, which is why my X factor would be Dorian Singer. I think I think he's going to get lost in the shuffle. I think... If you're Oregon, you're going to go, let's stop that guy who's getting all the touchdowns. He has, you know, I think he's tied for second in the country in terms of uh, receiving touchdowns with seven, uh, Jacob Cowing, um, you know, T-Mac, they know all about him. He just won Pac-12 freshman of the week. But as I said, Dorian Singer ended up having the best catch in that game last week. And so, but I think he's going to get kind of lost in the shuffle here. And he's very capable of going off and having a really tremendous game, uh, catching passes and making big plays. He kind of was that big play threat, you know, towards the end of the season last year that, uh, Jacob Count has kind of become, but um, you know, now they're a really nice tandem going down the field. I think there's going to be opportunities for Dorian Singer to make some big plays. Uh, as you mentioned, the secondary at Oregon isn't quite what it used to be and, and what it was last year. They had a lot of guys last year that were, you know, NFL caliber type of DBs. And so 
Um, they do have some talent in that secondary, but it's just a different group. And so I think there's going to be opportunities for Arizona to exploit that with someone like Dorian Singer, who again, might get lost. Tanner McLaughlin might get lost in that shuffle and, and some of those guys might be able to do some things. Uh, maybe get, you know, some of those running backs, you know, utilized in the passing game as well. And so um, it would be nice to have Rayshon Luke, I think if you're Arizona to mix it up a little bit and just have some speed, you know, that you can use as a receiver. But um, I, I think Doran Singer is going to factor into this game in a pretty big way, if, especially if Arizona is able to win. So um, on that note, uh, we've been, we've been at this for a little while now, Troy. Um, let me take a look here at the, uh, point spread. I believe it's something somewhere around 13, something like that. 12 and a half, 13 and a half, something like that. Most places, uh, over under at 70 and a half. It looks like, um, what do you got this week? Take the over <laughs> Matt. Um, we're, we're officially in fall here in Tucson across the country and fall usually brings what season for most of the country. What season is fall? You got me, Troy. It's duck season. Ah. Arizona is going to get the W. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this game back and forth. I can see a blowout on blowout in this game, but I really like the direction Arizona's offense is moving. Um, I think the Wildcats win in double overtime, 48 to 42. Um, and they get an interception in the second overtime to seal the game and the fans storm the field. It will be the first time Arizona upsets a top 25 team since – Oregon when they came in to Tucson and lost 44 to 15 in the Kevin Sumlin era. Uh, Jed Fish gets his signature win and starts this rough stretch of games, which it's a gauntlet uh, off of a W. I'm not ready to go there yet. Um, I still need to, I, I'm a little bit concerned by giving up 20 points to Colorado last week. I think as much as that doesn't seem like it's all that much, Colorado has been terrible. <laughs> Colorado has yeah. been a terrible team this year and, uh, that's a, that's a bad sign for me. It's not great. Um, I do think the offense is going to be something different than what Oregon has seen this season. Um, Arizona's playing very, very well on offense. Uh, you mentioned it there that, you know, the last time, you know, this happened, uh, Arizona was able to win in Tucson in that 2018 game has actually won the last two against Oregon, in, uh, in Tucson, um, going back, I think like 10 years or so, uh, a lot of those games have either been played neutral sites or, uh, in Eugene. Those games haven't gone so well for Arizona. Arizona's lost four of the last five to the Ducks. But um, I'm not as high on the Ducks as I think everybody else is. I still think they're trying to figure some things out. I still think they're missing some elite talent that they'll have in the coming years and get back to being a you know, top five team. But um, I'm not fully a believer in Bo Nix yet. I do think they have some very nice pieces. But I think it's a little closer than what people are giving it credit for. Um I think it's going to be a close game. Uh, I, I really do. I think that Arizona's offense is going to be able to hang. I think the defense is going to have to take its lumps. Um, and I think it's going to do, um, you know, a good job of, of uh, you know, trying its best to contain that offense, not letting them go crazy on the ground. I think they're going to pick up, you know, a good amount of yards, but it's not going to be anything that is absurd. Um, but I just think that there's a little bit too much talent on Oregon's side. Um, and, and I think Arizona makes it a game. I don't think it's a blowout. I'd be surprised if it's a blowout. And on me saying that is going to be the clip we come back to next week when it is a blowout. But I really don't think so. I really, I really think they're, you know, two more evenly matched teams than people are giving it credit for. Um, I think Arizona will ha has the type of mentality to kind of get up for this game as well, especially if the crowd is into it. So um, I think it's going to be close, but I think uh, Oregon ends up winning at 41 to 38. I think it's going to be pretty high scoring. I think they're going to, I think Arizona is going to get its points. I think I just give that little separation to just a little bit better talent overall. Uh, and, and yeah, it's just a tough one to call, but I, I think, I think Arizona is going to end up losing this one by a field goal. Um, but that also means they could win this one very well uh, as well. So uh, who knows, but we'll see, but um, I think it's going to be a close one, but anything else you want to add Troy before we get out of here? Yeah. One guy to keep an eye on one last guy for Oregon, Terrence Ferguson, uh, been terrific in the red zone tight end. Uh, four touchdown reception. So it could be the red zone that decides this game. Arizona's improved offensively. They really haven't been tested defensively in the red zone because teams haven't needed to be there. Uh, they've been scoring a lot of touchdowns with long runs. So can Arizona win the battle of the red zone? Yeah. And I mean, a lot of these games, when, when Arizona has lost, they've been blowouts. I don't think that's going to happen this year. I, I just, I don't have that same feeling. I feel like this is going to be kind of a fun game, especially if the atmosphere is great. Um, I think it could be a fun game and it can be a well-played game where I think it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. And it's going to be one of those games that 
Jetfish can relate to the fans like, hey, look, it was fun. <laughs> Like, didn't you have fun and enjoy yourself? Which has kind of been his message all along is like, hey, come out to the stadium. They play a fun brand of football. Uh, you know, obviously Arizona is able to, you know, score points. And especially these last couple of weeks has been able to, um, you know, put points on the board. And that's exciting. Um, so I, I, I think it'll be a, a well-played game, a fun game. We'll see what happens with Oregon's penalties. Maybe that does come to bite them. Maybe it won't be as clean, but um, I think it'll be a fun game. But uh, we'll have plenty of coverage for you uh, from this weekend's game it's kind of turning up the notch a little bit on this season. Uh, it's going to be a fun stretch here for Arizona. We'll have uh, full coverage for you uh, the rest of this week and this weekend and next week. And always, of course, and basketball season's almost here. Uh, it's a good time uh, of year for Arizona. Fans. And so uh, we appreciate you all, uh, listening as always, and we'll catch you next time.